morning, everybody. Yay! Welcome to the Grow Green Landscape Professional Training Day 5, um, the FireWise Landscaping Day. I appreciate you all being here. And um, we have a really great lineup today. I'm so excited. We have the Austin Fire Department represented. We have Watershed Protection. We have someone from the Wildflower Center. So I think it's going to be a really, really informative day for you. Um, I'm going to step aside and let Justice Jones be your MC for the day. Um, so I'm going to introduce Justice. He is a program manager for the Wildflower Division at the City of Austin. He has two bachelor's of degrees from University of Texas. One is in environmental resource management and the other one in cultural anthropology. That's an interesting mix, Justice. Um, he also was in the Air Force um, where he participated in many missions, including Desert Operation Desert Storm. He's also an International Society of Arboriculture um, certified arborist, which is really cool because how many firemen are arborists too? Um, he's also um, worked in, in New Mexico with the village of Rio Dosa, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff he's done, but I'm just going to let him tell you and introduce him. So please help me welcome Justice Jones. Thank you, I'm very excited to be here. Um, Denise is very humble. She's truly the star of this show, and um, I appreciate her forward thinking on incorporating um, various aspects of how our landscapes uh, relate back to our community values and um, how we can enhance our best practices um, to protect those values um, based on our objective. And in the city of Austin, uh, most of our native uh, ecosystems have been adapted to experience low intensity uh, periodic fires without uh, negative long-term impacts. And that's essentially the definition for resiliency. Uh, you can um, withstand the impacts of an event without um, major consequences. Doesn't mean changes won't happen or occur. Uh, fires create change on the landscape. Um, they certainly do, but it doesn't have to be a negative consequence and the most negative consequence we associate with wildland fire is what happens when it reaches people's yard and their landscaping, uh, which is what we largely have control over. Uh, so we're excited that we have the folks we have here today. Um, it's a good cross-section of uh, folks that work for various agencies, um, the private sector, and even some communities that are working to prepare themselves and their con constituents with wildfire. Um, the good news about wildfire, if there um, is a, a sunny side or a silver lining, is that we're getting much, much closer to putting our finger on um, what the best practices are to reduce the likelihood that when we have that next fire, um, it results in catastrophic consequences. Um, and as you uh, pay attention to um, the trends that are happening in California and elsewhere across the country, um, it reminds us that uh, we live in a fire, fire environment that can experience those same type of consequences, and it's more of a matter of uh, when um, fire will come back to our landscape than if. So I want to plant the seeds that uh, uh, we live in an area that fire is a natural part of the process. Eliminating fire from this area is um, impossible, and it results in negative consequences where we have accumulation of debris and um, dead and down material in the forest that could carry a fire from the ground up into the tops of trees where it can be uh, harmful to the trees and very difficult for firefighters to suppress or control. So what we'd like to talk with you today is how um, you can help yourself, your clients, or the landscape that you manage be compatible with our fire adapted ecosystems. Uh, so if fire um, does occur, um, it can move from one landscape, whether it's a wildland landscape, um, to a, a residential or commercial landscape, and that landscape can provide a measure of protection through the practices applied. We can alter the fire behavior through the things that we do. So if we can go ahead and get started on the presentation, I'll walk you through a few slides. Um, as uh, Denise mentioned, we've got an all-star lineup for you here. So I just want to lay down some um, basic uh, terminology we'll be using that's unique to the fire service. Um, uh, let you know what our acronyms are so they make sense later in the day when we slip up and fall back into using terms like WUI, 
that probably means a whole lot nothing to you, so I'm going to lay it out there. That's the wildland urban interface. And so think where do homes, our built environment, uh, mix and intermingle with our natural environment? And what is usually between the homes and that natural environment? It's the landscaping that we install or exist or maintain. And that's where we feel like you can have the biggest impact in helping protect um, both our natural environment um, and our built environment. The reason being um, is that it protects both is fires originate primarily from individuals, from humans, and spread from humans out. That may be spreading out into the landscape or maybe spreading back towards their house and other houses. Um, but this truly is a human-driven um, factor. It's a, a component of our culture. And so a lot of what you're going to hear about today is helping people come to an understanding of their risk. Um, so they can make informed decisions about how to address that in a way that's compatible with the community that we live in. Um, the reality is uh, most of us woke up to wildfire pretty recently. Um, 2011 was, I would say, the dawn of wildland interface fire in Texas. It was the worst year on record. And we burned almost 4 million acres. 3,000 homes were destroyed. Um, and we had all available resources um, in the country at the time. Um, if we were to have that same circumstances right now, uh, California is burning, the Northwest is burning, uh, we would certainly be resource starved and very much the survivability of our homes and our built environment depends on the actions that we've taken before that wildfire occurred um, and doing so in awareness that what we do may affect um, a firefighter's ability to fend our home or our historic structures or even the, the landscape. Um, but it has to happen before a fire occurs um, because the nature of our fires are different than just about um, anywhere else in the country. They happen very quick, um, they spread very fast, and they're over before uh, most people really have an opportunity to react. And the behavior, if we want to know what we can expect um, in the city of Austin and the surrounding area with our fire, we just have to look back to what we experienced. Um, we can uh, um, hypothesize with models and try to do predictions, but the best indicator is what's happened before. Um, we know that when we have a wildfire season, we're going to have lots of starts all at once. Um, we mostly have small fires. Our landscape is fairly fragmented in Austin and Travis County, uh, but we have abundance of natural and open areas. Those small fires result in significant losses in relation to the size. Um, and we almost always, during a wildfire, are going to have more homes exposed at risk than we have physical resources to protect those homes. And that's the reality of the challenge that uh, our communities face. Wildland urban interface fire is different from any other type of fire the fire department will face because it almost, um, from the initiation, can exceed resource capacity. And it's not just a rural issue. We very often think of wildfire as something that happens out there. Uh, wildfire is a, um, relying on a set of conditions, of uh, uh, physical factors of the presence of um, fuel, something that will burn, a heat source, which 90% of the time is humans, and oxygen. Um, we're not going to be able to do a whole lot or want to do a whole lot with the oxygen factor. We can change the fuel and we can change people's behavior. Um, but we know that the physical environment um, changes as a result of our changes in perception and consciousness. So our first uh, um, call to arms is a change of uh, hearts and minds towards the recognition of uh, the fire adapted nature of our ecosystem and owning our role in that ecosystem. Then we'll start to see changes on the landscape that we need to protect communities. Uh, because most of the fires happen within two miles of community. They spread very fast. Um, you'll have very little time to prepare for your uh, clients or uh, the land that you manage to um, prepare during that um, period between when a fire starts and when it impacts something. Um, so it's critical that um, all the steps that you need to take happen long before a wildfire occur. Um, we just got through one of the wettest uh, seasons on record um, and when it's raining and the um, humidity is high and the likelihood that your work is going to uh, result in a fire is the best time to mitigate it. We often forget about it and we're worried about other things, but um, the awareness needs to be part of our culture and something that we embody. Because if you want to put a bullseye on where the potential for human loss of life and property in Texas is, um, it's certainly the epicenter is Central Texas. You saw that with the Bastrop fires and the fires that we experienced here back home. Um, 
just intuitively, if you can't read the numbers, red is worse. It's the density of homes lost on interface fire across the state um, that we've tracked. And as I mentioned, when fires do happen here, um, they typically happen simultaneously. So the resources we would normally count on to help us with a large structure fire or a hazmat incident um, are going to be dealing with their own fires and have their hands full. So it very much comes down to a partnership between the fire service, um, our cooperators in our, the city and county, and most importantly, uh, what the private sector, what residents and those who provide services uh, do to address that wildfire risk beforehand. The good news is this isn't an amorphous threat. We can put our finger on where the wildfire risk exists. And um, one of the ways we've done that is through the Texas Wildfire Risk Assessment. Uh, the, the darker the area, the higher the concentration of people in association with wildland fuels. So another way to look at that, uh, this is the, the fire plane, if you will. We're all familiar with the flood plane and uh, um, what that means to us, whether we agree where they draw the lines or not. Uh, this is as close as we've ever come to defining our fire plane, where we know fires are likely to occur because three things exist. We've got the fuel, um, we've got the heat sources, meaning people, um, and of course we've got the oxygen. And that has to, the physical factors have to be present for that to occur. Um, to look at the type of fire behavior we might experience, and uh, Luke Ball with Austin Water Utility um, is very knowledgeable of our local fire behavior, and we'll be talking about some of the impacts later today, so I don't want to steal his thunder. What you really need to know is that a fire occurring in um, much, many of our fuel types can spread a mile in less than a, um, a half an hour. That doesn't give you um, time to uh, take action other than life safety and protection measures. So you've got to um, act beforehand, and when a fire strikes, um, we've got to act fast. How does landscaping relate to that? I would say if uh, you consider your home, um, your castle, your landscaping can be your moat. That can be the protection measure that can break that cycle of physics, that chain reaction of fire, consuming fuel, um, and moving across the landscape. If it hits something that won't burn um, or is not combustible, um, the rules of physics still apply and it won't burn. Um, once we understand that principle that we can break that chain, it demystifies a lot of the confusion about wildfire. It won't happen if you uh, take one of those factors away. <clears throat> and here's a, just a physical um, illustration of that. Um, the reality is if you lower the fire intensity, um, if you rearrange fuels in the landscape to eliminate direct paths, uh, you can have a major impact on whether people's homes survive or not. And as land managers, landscapers, I'm not sure if you've thought about it from that perspective, um, but the service that you provide very much as a public safety service. If you ask a firefighter like Josh Anderson uh, what type of environment that he needs to show up to be effective, um, those environments are being largely designed and controlled to some degree by folks um, in this room. And so both you have an opportunity um, because uh, this is a, a valuable skill to have and to be able to market to the public and you have a responsibility to make sure um, that you know if you're working in a high risk area, you're not doing anything that's again inadvertently uh, create harm for your clients. Um, you want to help them, you want to sustain their business, and the best way to do that is to make sure that their home and landscape stay intact, right? Uh, if you want to return business, you got to have a home to come back to, and you have an important role in making sure it stays there. Um, but it starts with an understanding of um, what the real factors that influence um, how homes burn um, and some of the myths that surround them. So I just want to go through this pretty quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bittner with the Texas A&M Forest Service, who's um, got subject matter expertise in this, is one of our key partners in wildfire mitigation. And one of the myths is it takes a big fire to cause major losses. Uh, that's what we hear about in the West. We hear size of acres, bigger, badder, but the uh, reality is here, we experience small uh, size fires that on average have higher proportional losses than large fires, meaning um, on average we lose uh, one home for every five acres we've burned on these fires. Pinnacle fires, uh, 100 acres, 10 homes lost. The Steiner Ranch fire, um, 125 acres, 25 homes lost. Um, Moongo fire up in uh, Leander, uh, 84 acres, 16 homes lost. Most of these were um, isolated pockets of vegetation or um, fingers of vegetation that led up into communities.
but there's some more myths to bust because that might make you think that your trees are out to get you if um, I said that they follow these fingers of native fuel and vegetation in the community. But take a look at those cir circles um, compared to what's happening with the houses themselves. And I apologize, this is a home that was destroyed on the Steiner Ranch fire and probably hits close to home, but uh, so does wildfire. So what stands out to you um, that seems a little bit uh, out of place? The houses are burning, they're fully involved, but none of the trees are burning. That just doesn't seem right, does it? It's pretty much the opposite of what we've been told our whole uh, lives are uh, taught to assume. That doesn't mean trees adjacent to home can't be a problem, um, but if you remove all the trees out of this yard, would that have made a difference of whether it burned or not? Clearly it wasn't the fault of the trees. Um, it can be an issue, but it wasn't in this case in many um, instances that we saw. I don't know how this, well this shows up, but sadly, uh, the rows down the middle um, are gray ash from homes. Uh, what remains intact, to, by and large, on either side of those homes? It's trees, and um, not to mention it's juniper trees, uh, which um, by many perception are um, highly volatile, and not to say that they can't be, but everything in a fire-adapted ecosystem can burn at some point. Um, so how do we reconcile the fact that um, most people think wildfire mitigation means um, I'm going to have to take out my trees and that's usually a way to get escorted right off the property out of the gate, right? You start talking about um, removing trees that somebody named after their daughter who was born or grandma when she passed on. It's not just a tree, it's a, a value that they um, it resonates with them and can make a difference of whether they hear the true message of how they can protect those trees in addition to their home uh, from wildfire risk. Um, the other perception we see very often is the uh, big bag wolf perception is I've got a home that's got um, ignition resistant roof or siding that won't ignite and so um, I'm in the clear. The reality is um, those components will help you, but the most insidious cause of home losses in, in Texas are embers that travel well ahead of the main fire. The reason the, many of those homes ignited on Steiner Ranch before the trees did is because embers landed in areas around and in the home where it could have access and smolder and ignite long enough uh, to involve that structure. So the reality is we have to take embers into account when we're evaluating the risk to landscape. And why this matters for you, um, most of the people that we talk to that have a perception of risk are those that back up directly to natural areas or can see those natural areas, gives them some sense of apprehension. The reality in the fuel type that we live in, uh, we've documented embers traveling nine kilometers ahead of the main fire. What that really means is just because you're not in the woods doesn't mean you're out of the woods. Uh, if embers the biggest threat that our homes face, um, and we saw in the Pinnacle Fire homes igniting two to three blocks ahead of, of the actual fire. Um, this may be a more of a community-wide issue um, from a defensible space and land landscaping standpoint than just going off in the wild land areas and cutting out all the trees because the reality is that ecosystem will burn. It's just a matter of how it can burn. Um, our homes and their ignitability are what we largely have control over, including that landscaping. This was uh, an interesting home. This was on the Cross Plains fire in 2005. Uh, if you notice, the fire burned um, through the landscape. If you can see that, it's very short residential grass, um, very little residential landscaping. Um, this is uh, Eve uh, to the attic on one end of the house. That's the other end of the house. If you notice, the fire intensity around the entire perimeter of this home was spotty and uh, really low intensity. This was the first house in Texas documented to um, be confirmed lost from embers. Uh, there was very little fire around the perimeter. It got in the attic and burned the home from the inside. So that's one of the weakest links that um, we're confronted with. From a landscaping standpoint, those embers are gonna rain down on a, a homeowners or a, a building surroundings as a snowstorm will. Anywhere they land, if there's combustible uh, materials, firewood, other things you're gonna hear about today, it can be problematic. So um, keep in mind that uh, your clientele may be beyond the traditional perception of uh, risk being a factor of being adjacent to um, natural areas. Uh, windows that aren't with sign, uh, 
designed to withstand wildfire can be very problematic. And so if you're evaluating a customer's landscape and they have single pane windows with um, bushes growing uh, right in front of them, especially if they're of a volatile nature, um, that can compromise uh, otherwise ignition resistant structure. Heat can radiate through the windows um, and break the glass and allow embers and other things to enter into the home. Uh, so there's a direct link between landscaping and whether uh, embers are able to compromise windows. And the big bad perception, and this is uh, scary for a lot of people, this is a picture of the, pin the uh, PK fire in uh, north central Texas. It's predominantly an oak juniper woodland, similar to what we see in some of the western parts of the county under very extreme conditions. Uh, this is a home that was located um, directly adjacent to this area. So given your um, perspective, if you've got a wall of fire moving towards a home, um, that fast and that intense, what's the likelihood of a home surviving that? I would say it's very high if they have done the things that they need to do to prepare that home for wildfire. Um, this particular home had a metal roof, uh, largely non-combustible siding. They had integrated some um, zeroscaping or other uh, landscaping principles um, that uh, reduced the spread of fire across the landscape and created an environment where fire crews felt comfortable um, in defending this structure and the truth is they had to do very little to protect it, um, it um, by and large protected it itself. Um, that's the same type of fire environment that um, we can experience without losses but um, we've got to start by addressing the factors that contribute most to the loss and much of that falls within your realm. And the biggest tough sell is that I've got to moonscape my uh, yard in order to have effective um, area that will prohibit fire spread. Uh, this is another home on the Cross Plains fire, very little landscaping. They had uh, debris and material stacked behind the home. Embers landed back there and ignited what otherwise would have been a really resistant landscape and a home. Uh, so we're going to go through some checklists today that help you understand the process for evaluating a home's risk, um, developing even a work plan or a mitigation strategy that you can provide back to your partners or homeowners. Uh, so they have a game plan and you have a marketable tool that you can use to engage the public. Um, and I want to just really quickly um, uh, leave off on a final note with the Bastrop fire. It was the third worst fire in U.S. history related to per capita losses. Over 600 homes burned in the first hour. And because the community of uh, Bastrop has a community wildfire protection plan like uh, Austin and Travis County do, they were able to identify areas that were uh, so potentially volatile um, that their best option for life safety was to focus on evacuation. So the first part of that fire, they were getting people out of harm's way. What that meant, if we're moving people out, um, it's really hard for us to get in and operate safely. Our first priority as a fire service is going to be life safety. Um, you're going to hear a little bit about evacuation today in, in general, but the reality is we can't fight the fire until the community is out and safe. Uh, so that uh, first hour, uh, first half of the day was very telling. What we saw is total of 2,853 homes that were destroyed, but 1,157 of them in that same footprint of the fire survived. So half again as many homes survived in the footprint of the most intense and catastrophic fire in Texas history, and they did so largely without the aid of suppression resources based on what the homeowner had done before the fire occurred, the construction of that home, and um, in many cases, uh, the little things that they did or didn't do that uh, made a huge difference. Now everything they did would have helped a firefighter if they were able to show up, but the truth is um, our focus is life safety and in situations like this, we've got to make tough choices. They made the right choice to protect life, um, but it created a vacuum and an opportunity to um, evaluate um, what a house could do in, to protect itself and what homeowners could do to protect that house so it could stand alone. Um, so uh, don't underestimate the value that you add to the services you provide for the public or the city of Austin. And we're very excited that uh, you're here to learn about this. I uh, hope you uh, take it home with you and uh, share this information um, in your yard if it matters, but with your clients and partners so they can protect themselves. Um, you have information that's equivalent of the, some of the first folks that have found out about the fire plane and that fire is a reality for us. Uh, you, we need you to be an ambassador and share that message, but we ask that you've got to do it with integrity. Um, 
selling a product as a wildfire risk reduction when there's no risk um, isn't what we're after, but helping people address their wildfire risk in ways that you can qualify by taking a look at the Texas wildfire risk assessment or other factors to determine if there is a risk and how you can adjust your services to be most compatible with that environment is really what we're after. So with that, um, we can't guarantee that homes will survive a wildfire, but what we've seen um, both from a, a, a case study standpoint and anecdotally is the, the homes that um, take that little bit of effort and the homeowners that take a little bit of effort to protect the home makes all the difference in the world. It doesn't have to be costly um, or expensive. Um, it can start with the ground up approach and uh, really help um, enhance people's quality of life and protect what they care about most and enhance your ability to serve them. So with that, I'll uh, leave it there. I apologize. Um, I have to go to another engagement directly after this. So Lieutenant Josh Anderson and uh, Program Coordinator Linda Haney will help me, would be helping coordinate the rest of the day. Uh, I've got a great lineup of speakers that um, are going to walk you through really everything that you know, need to know to be able to operate um, effectively in Austin, mitigate wildfire risk without causing undue harm to our environment or other values. Um, and in do so a way that is a real marketable value to the citizens of Austin.